Uh, go. If you can hear me in the live chat, g'day. Uh, we've got a very special evening this evening because not only am I in a different location, I look like I'm next to a painting and there's a mirror behind me. I'm actually on the road and I'll explain why in just a minute. But we're also joined by my friend and a fantastic investor, Andrew Page, who is the founder of strawman.com. So we'll have Andrew uh, join us at around about 6.15, so in about 15 minutes. Uh, and Andrew's going to talk to talk with us about two companies that I've followed for quite a few years, and I know he's followed for quite a few years, and I know we've both spoken to management in that time. And also this week, we're joined once again by Alex behind the keyboard. So if you see uh, self wealth in the live chat tonight, it's a chance. There's a chance it could be me or it could be Alex. So hello to Alex and to, hello to everyone. As you know, anything that we do mention in tonight's podcast, uh, in tonight's live session, not a podcast, is limited to general financial information only. If you need personal financial advice, be sure to see a financial planner because they can take into account your needs, goals, and objectives. Hello to everyone. G'day, Martin. Not as cold here in Launceston at the moment. Jenny, it's negative two, but okay as I am by the fire. Jenny, where are you joining us from? That's, um, that's uh, pretty cold. Pretty cold indeed. Um, I'm here on the Gold Coast and it was a lovely day. I might say it was about 20 degrees and a bit of sun. So I, I let go of um, Melbourne's weather, fortunately, and uh, came up here for a couple of days. And the reason that I'm up here is that I, actually today I was fortunate enough to spend the day with the AFL um, Gold Coast Suns team. So I came up here and talked to them about investing. It was a fantastic chat for about an hour or so. And we, we spoke about... Um, basically all, everything you need to know about investing in about 60 minutes, which is heaps of fun. And it's great to learn from those guys as well. So um, I'm on the road, but we are still doing our usual segments. That includes my favorite joke of the week. So this joke is a little bit different. I've got to admit because it's a little bit self-deprecating, not only of me, but of the finance industry. And I hope that I can one day change this. And here's my joke. It is. What's the difference between the stock market and statistics? Some people do get statistics. That's the answer. So that's my joke for this evening. How did I do? Out of 10, maybe a six, maybe a seven. Just leading that one down there. Jenny, you're coming from Mount Buller. Wow. Yeah, nice. Snowfields uh, down in Mount Buller. Fantastic. I was actually chatting to an investor today from um, Vancouver, who's a ski instructor as well, uh, while he's also an analyst. And he said, he said to me, Whistler... The, the snowfields at Whistler are the size of all of the Australian snowfields put together, which is, uh, I think, fascinating. Um, okay, I can see that Andrew, uh, I can see that Andrew likes my joke. So that's that's a good one. Uh, one out of 10 says, Jason, mm, come on, mate, surely, surely. Lynette, hi, hello, everyone. First time here. Fantastic, Lynette. Welcome to the show. We're here every Wednesday. Um, get a pocket full of shell. Always a pleasure to have you back. Uh, Screffy, you said so interesting to see the self wealth top 10 index contains two strong bear ETFs. Does it really? I haven't actually had a look. We can have a quick look at that in just a moment. But as usual, after my wonderful joke, we talk about uh, all of the things that uh, we want to know, which is what are people buying? What are people selling? And as always, if you guess the top 10, uh, top five correctly in five, four, three, two, number one, if you get the number one most bought and the number one most sold, you get a free pass to uh, my value investor program usually retails at 499 and you also get some free trades through self wealth so why not guess the way to guess what are in the top five at number one most sold number two uh, number one most bought is to just put them in the live chat there genevieve you, you've said yep skiing in canada leaves the australian fields for dead scruffy you've guessed lke and lke solid picks would have been solid picks last week peter you've given me a three out of ten Okay, interesting, interesting. I'll take that. Something to improve upon. Pocket full of shell, 10 out of 10 for not actually a joke. <laughs> well, yeah, that made me laugh, so that, that counts. Um, pocket full of shell, you've guessed most bought, BHP, most sold, CSL. All right, we're in the self-wealth platform. Let's get to it. So we're going to start at five, fifth most bought, right through to number one. And what I might actually do before you get your guesses in, I might allow you, because we're going to do something, um, we're going to flip-flop like we normally do, but I'm going to allow guesses for ETFs because ETFs are in tonight's list. So just as a FYI, 
ETFs are included tonight. But what I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. One of either most bought or most sold is an ETF and one is a share. So I hope that gives you a few hints. So get those in. I'll give you an extra minute. Um, Peter, you've asked a question. Will Alcidian go back up so much in the red? Yeah, uh, great question, Peter. Um, Andrew and I will talk about Alcidian tonight. That's the company that's on our list. So ALC is this business just here. We're going to be talking about this in a few moments. Uh, around about quarter past six, uh, Andrew's dialing in to join us. So uh, we'll see what's going on lately and how does it all, like, what is the business? What does it do? Jason has guessed VDHG LKE. Errol's guessed most bought VAS sold LKE. Uh, Pog full of shells should, should wait for all of the clues. Most bought and most sold VAS is Pog full of shell. Well, maybe shell if you guess. Yeah, there we go. Updated. So BHP bought VAS sold. Okay, here we go. I'm going to start at five, and hopefully it clears a few things up. In at number in at number five, most bought this week. This year's Australia A200. Normally, the A200 ETF is not in the top five, but this week investors are obviously looking at it. So the difference between A200 and the Vanguard VAS ETF, which is the one that we cover a lot of the time, is Vanguard VAS includes 300 shares or thereabouts, and Beta Shares A200 includes 200. Vanguard has a fee of, I think it's around 0.1%, and Beta Shares is about 0.07, so about 0.03 uh, points better uh, for A200. But VAS is shit. Uh, fees are coming down. In at number four, we've got LKE, Lake Resources. Now I can tell you that Lake appears in both sets of um, lists tonight. So we can see it requested a trading halt recently. I'm going to guess that this may be due to a report that was issued. Um, the company, yes, they have said that indeed. The company requests a trading halt in response uh, to pending a response being prepared to an online report. For those of you that don't uh, keep up to date with your news on Twitter or wherever you get your information, Lake Resources was actually um, the subject of a short seller a report, I believe, and now it has gone into a trading halt. So shares this week are frozen. Remember our list of top five is for last week. In at number three on the most bought list, we've got Fortescue Metals Group, Old Faithful Fortescue Metals Group. Um, let's see what the analysts are forecasting for the year ahead in terms of dividends. As always, you know, these could be mistakes. They may not be necessarily correct. We've got a forecast of $1.51 per share in dividends. Given that it's uh, Fortescue, it will most likely come with franking credits as well, which is very, very tasty. In at number two. Now, you may remember this from last week where I named it as the one thing that I would invest in today, which is the Vanguard Diversified High Growth Index ETF. Normally, Vanguard VDHG is in at number one or, or number two, but some of you would have guessed that because I named it last week. Um, so it is actually uh, in at number two tonight. And I see, Shell, you said, I bought some A200 myself via SelfWealth. So you perhaps contributed. So you did invest in A200. There you go. Um, you probably did contribute to the statistics. So thank you for that. Uh, in at number one, and a few of you have guessed this, is Vanguard Australian Shares Index ETF. It was actually quite close between the two this uh, this evening. Uh, Vanguard VAS and VDHG. So this is the ETF that invests, as I said before, in the 300 top Australian shares. One of those ones for the bond drawer. A lot of people love this. They uh, pretty much just dollar cost average into it, just buy regularly and keep buying, um, which makes a lot of sense for a lot of investors uh, to have exposure to the Australian stock market. Here's an interesting st statistic for you, seeing that we're talking about the Australian share market as a whole. Over 122 years, 81% of the years, that's calendar years, have been positive returns for share market investors. So 81% of the 122 years have been positive. And the worst year ever for performance calendar year is during the GFC when the Australian share market fell about 50%. Uh, that was the worst year on record. So how's that? Okay, so now that's the top five, four, three, two, one, most bought. Now we've got most sold, as usual. Get your guesses in if you haven't already. Um, I can see, Adam, you've said BHP is sinking. What is going on? I don't actually know. Um, 
I don't actually know. Let's we'll see if the company's issued any news or announcements. Uh, BHP is not a company that I follow really closely because it's um, not a company that I have as part of my more active the active side of my portfolio. Um, we can see there's really no news out from the business recently. Perhaps their uh, maybe commodity prices have been weaker lately. So perhaps that is um, a way to explain it. Let's have a look at some commodity prices. So here we can see uh, the commodity index. This is just on indexmonday.com. Anyone can access this. So we can see the commodities. We'll zoom in on that. The commodities index has fallen recently. So this tracks prices of metals and all that type of thing. Uh, just a different basket of metals. So we can see prices have fallen recently. So um, maybe that explains some of it. Um, okay. So let's go on with the top five most bought, uh, most sold, sorry, given that the market it has been pretty volatile lately. There's been a lot of buying and selling. What's in at number five, four, three, two, one? In at number uh, regular on this list, uh, given its, uh, I guess, lithium uh, focus, Pilbara Minerals in at number five on the most sold. This is one regular company that was uh, a regular in the, the most bought recently, but obviously sentiment is starting to shift. In at number four, most sold, which is fascinating to me. An ETF does not normally come in at the in the top five most sold the ivv etf has been amongst the five most sold shares or etfs inside self wealth over the past week so i mean i mean there's a lot of volatility going on in u.s markets at the moment but i would have thought this i wouldn't have thought this makes it so high on the list we can see of the people that are selling a lot more people buying but of the people that are selling people say aligning with target portfolio taking profits and other um, it is ownership rank number 22 in the whole self-wealth community. So it's a pretty big holding for most people. Uh, in at number three, we've got Lake Resources again. So it was number uh, four most bought, number three most sold. Let's scroll down, have a quick look. People who are selling, 48% say that they're taking profits. Of those who are buying, 39% say it's undervalued. I find a company like Lake Resources very hard to value, mind you, because... Uh, when it's so early stage, it's very, very difficult to value. I mean, you can value the, the, the mine side and you can value projects. But typically what happens is when you do a valuation, you have the valuation of, say, a mine or a project. Uh, and then you have a probability that it actually reaches production. And the probability is actually the part where most investors get caught out. Is they, you know, 70% likely that this project is going ahead only to find that it doesn't go ahead and it was actually a zero. And I don't really invest in those types of situations because for me, it's kind of binary. It's either it works or it doesn't. And I don't really like that. Uh, in it two most sold is CSL. CSL is obviously the big, people put it in the healthcare bucket, but it's actually biopharmaceuticals because it does um, like uh, snake bite antivenom. And it does things uh, with blood plasma and transfusions and those types of things. Influenza, this is what CSL does. And it's one of the three big players in the world um, that have really excelled. Even though this business, I believe, is over 100 years old. I could be mistaken, but I believe it's about 100 years old. Uh, and it's still going strong, still growing at scale. It's incredible. Okay, finally, we have drum roll. Please. If anyone guessed this, I don't know if anyone did in the live chat. So... Um, Let's have a look. Let's have a look. I don't know if anyone did. I can't see it. I can't see it. In at number one on the most sold list is Fortescue Metals Group. Fortescue, um, you know, which we just looked at, is likely to pay a dividend, according to analysts in the year ahead. Revenue is forecast to fall, uh, probably with commodity prices. We can see net profits are also expected to fall. And we can see how many analysts have been, um, I guess, part of that judgment. So here we can see there are 18 analysts surveyed. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like to me, I could be mistaken, but it doesn't look like anyone is has managed to pick both tonight. But I can see pocket full of shell. Uh, you, you've got VA uh, in, in your two. So that's interesting. Um, Mike, you've said, or Mick, sorry, you've said, uh, VDHG has pretty much shown no growth over its lifespan of nearly five years. Is five years too short a time frame for VDHG? Well, I'm going to quickly go and just have a look at something for you there. 
Nick, let's have a quick look at this. This is the ETF on the website. And if we look at it, if we look right here at the returns and performance, uh, here we go. I want a table. Thank you, Vanguard. And we can see the performance of this ETF over. And here we've got three years. We can see that it's 5.16%. Remember that this includes dividends. So dividends are important to include. Whereas when we look at the share price, it doesn't always include dividends. So it only looks at the share price. That's why it looks like it's going uh, in one direction. So uh, also worth noting is actually when I looked at this chart this morning and it only had the end of May, the returns were closer to 8.8%. To, uh, so what that means to say is like the stock market has turned down recently, but I would say the longer we get to look at a, um, a portfolio like this, the better. For me, I think five to 10 years is the ideal amount of time to judge an ETF like this one that's so diversified. We've only got the benchmark. We don't actually have the fund performance yet over five years because it hasn't been around that long, Nick. Okay, so now I'm going to switch and I'm going to introduce my friend and fellow small cap investor, Andrew Page. Andrew is the a founder of strawman.com, which I'm sure he'll introduce in just a second. Andrew is joining us from Sydney. Uh, he's got his wonderful screen there behind him. Um, Andrew, welcome to Self Wealth Live. G'day, mate. Good to be here. Yeah, it's um, fantastic to have you coming through loud and clear and, and joining us this evening. Um, I'm sure many of our viewers tonight are familiar with you. They maybe follow you on Twitter. They maybe are a, a user of strawman.com. They maybe have um, a history with you going back to The Motley Fool or even earlier than that. But tell us a little bit about yourself, mate. What do you do each day and um, what have you created at strawman.com? I try to do as little as I can each day, if I'm being honest. <laughs> Um, and I, I say that, I say that proudly. I think if, look, there's different strokes for different folks and I've learned to be agnostic in terms of how people approach the market and you should do, you should do you, you should do it in a way that aligns with your predilections and your emotional temperament and the rest of it. But I think if you're the kind of person that has six screens and you're spending, you know, eight hours a day looking at charts and stock prices, you're doing it wrong. I, I want, mm. I think one of the great things about the share market is, I mean, there's no shortcuts. There's a lot of work that's involved, but once I've done the work, I want to take an ownership in a really great business and I want to let them do all the work. <laughs> and I just want mm. to sit back and collect the benefits of the long-term compounding machine that I've hopefully identified. And that is the best, that is the, that is, that is the end goal, right? I, we, we all work for our money to a point and I'm, trying to get to a stage where the money works for me, if you know what mm. I mean. So when I say I do very little, I've spent a hell of a lot of time trying to get to know the companies in my portfolio very well. And of course, I stay up to date with them. But generally, day to day, week to week, and even month to month, not a hell of a lot's changing. The, the companies like we're going to talk about two tonight, EnviroSuite and City, and they are exactly the same companies today as they were six months ago. Yep, we've got mm. some more data on them, but I would argue that really there's not much that's changed at all in terms of the investment thesis, the outlook, the business mechanics, any of those kinds of things. So I'm going to get out of the way and let them let them do their thing. And their thing is hopefully bringing in more and more and more cash and reinvesting that cash for even higher rates of return and, and just making me a lot of money over many, many years. I like it, mate. What does it, Morgan House will say? 99% of long-term investing is doing nothing. The other 1% changes our life. It's, it really is. And it's there's a Blaise Pascal quote, which is, you know, um, the hardest thing a man can do is sit in a room and, and do nothing, you know, mm, which yeah. I think is so true. We feel yeah. as if we've got a fiddle because it's so easy to press buttons these days on our apps and execute a trade and react to this and something's happened. And there's always something happening. But but mm. really, when you pan out, there's a, most of it's most of it's irrelevant. So, you know, sit mm. on your bum. Turn, it's, turn it's, out the it's, noise. It's, it's it's tune it tune out the noise. Very few people s succeed long term in the market, not because they don't have the intelligence or the capabilities or the skills. They don't have the patience and they don't have the emotional fortitude. And Buffett talks about this all the time. You you don't need a high IQ. You just you just need a you just need to be the kind of person who can, I guess, face all of that with ambivalence and the ups and downs and and shrug their shoulders and and. And, and just roll with the punches. We all think we can, 
until we have a really brutally crushing bear market and that really sort of you know, <laughs> separates separates those who can those that can't but unfortunately it's it's it it comes at the territory and 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 honestly it's it's not something to be afraid of it's something to embrace I, I, long long may that be the case because if if humanity all of a sudden becomes hyper rational my edge is gone <laughs> and <laughs> i'm gonna have to find something else to do um okay mate before we get to these two companies uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about what Strawman does? I can see from the comments already that it, a lot That's of folks funny. know what Strawman, Strawman yeah. is. Yeah, um, but why don't you just tell us a little bit about the platform that you've built and why you did it? Yeah, sure. So it's, it, we're a private online investment club, which is what Sparky is referencing there. Is um, a podcast editor with Scott Phillips. He likes to ask me that every single week, as if he doesn't know. Um, but yeah, look, the, the the idea is is what it would have always been as a, as a club. Whether you're meeting up at a cafe or a pub or around someone's kitchen table, we want to get a group of engaged, self-directed mm. investors. We want to share ideas. We want to challenge each other's ideas. In fact, the reason it's called Straw Man is because we I genuinely think and firmly believe that the best way to improve an investment idea is to challenge it. If everyone in this chat right now was convinced that Fortescue Metals was the best stock. And all we did was talk about how smart we all are and aren't we all geniuses. We're really, we're going to feel good, but we're probably not going to emerge any, any more informed. What we want, and what you want to do is you want to engage with the people mm. who disagree with you. Not because we, we, don't, we don't want to have, get into arguments for the sake of arguments, but you want a good natured, thoughtful disagreement is what Ray Dalio calls it. And I'm a huge believer in that. So the, the idea is, is that, we do it with a bit of technology. So everyone's got a sample portfolio. Um, uh, even if you've got a free account, we're not open for, for paying members at the moment, but if you get on there and get a free account, we'll give you $100,000. Unfortunately, it's play money, but it's $100,000 <laughs> of play it. money and you can, you can buy some shares. And so hopefully you get a bit of experience uh, with that. But the idea is with our members, I can, whenever I catch up with investors, it's always like, what are you buying? What are you holding? Why? What do you think it's worth? So we, we wanted a platform that sort of answers all of those questions. So if I dial you up on straw man, I can say, well, Owen's holding these stocks in these proportions. Here are the trades he's done. Here's how he's performed over the last three, six, 12 months back to infinity. Um, and then I can click on those stocks and I can see what you've written about them. I can see how you've valued them. I can, and, and we're trying to sort of, we're trying to um, allow this collective intelligence to mm. emerge in a way where we can, we can, yeah, uncover some really good ideas, have those ideas challenged. Um, yeah, and we, we also, a big part of the value prop for our premium members is that we catch up with management teams regularly. We caught up with um, Kath from Self Wealth back in April, actually. Yeah, get, yeah, you did. Yeah, it was really great insights. And so we, we're trying to, we're just trying to, it's very hard for the retail investor to get in front of CEOs and executives. It's something that the fund managers get to sort of have all the fun there, but we feel as though, Retail investors should should ha I hate that term by the way retail investors but you know private individual investors should have that opportunity not because you're getting any inside mm. information but because you're able to sort of ask the kinds of questions that can give you some unique insights and, and a little bit of an edge in just understanding the business a lot better. Mm, I agree. One of those companies that uh, I know you know and you've covered for years um, is a company called Envirosuite. Uh, and I'm hoping you can uh, just dive into this a little bit for us. And for those people who don't know much about the company, um, if you can just give us a bit of a business profile, what does it do? Um, what's its history? And, and maybe we can just go from there. And if you have any yeah. questions for Andrew or myself throughout this conversation, as always, just chuck them in the chat. I can see Genevieve have said the discussion on AVA was really interesting. It is now on my watch list. I think they were referencing something else on the podcast that you did, mate. But Envirosuite, tell us about it. Yes, geez, I just had a good run lately as well. I'm wishing I bought more actually when it was low. But anyway, um, can I just say at the start, Owen, that this is I, you know, don't don't do anything because I'm saying it. In fact, I would I would really encourage anyone on on this call to sort of look at everything I say with a huge degree of skepticism. And your job really should be to try and shoot 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 it down in flames and, and pick holes in it. So that's. That's the first thing to say. The other thing to say is that I don't think you, before you ask anyone an opinion on a, on a stock or a business, you've got to understand what's their, what's their context. So I'm not a trader. I'm a very long-term investor. I'm looking at a company, any company that I buy, I'm looking for at least a three-year 
ideally a five to 10 year time frame. So please don't at me on Twitter if this is down 30% next week, because <laughs> it has every chance of, of doing exactly that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so all of, all of that out of the way. Um, EnviroSuite is uh, all about environmental intelligence. Um, so basically they, they, they have these devices in the field around mine sites, around airports, that will collect information on odors, on sound, on dust particles, gas emissions, all of these kinds of environmental pollutants. And they aggregate all of that together in, into these um, SaaS uh, platforms, which gives their um, users, their clients, um, it, it gives them a description of what's going on with, with their sites. Um, it allows them to not only see what is happening in real time, now, let me just go back a step. Back in the day, you'd have these mm -hmm. collection um, pods out, out next to your mine or whatever, and you'd have these environmental consultants who'd go out and collect it, take it back to the lab, analyze it, you know, and a day later you might get some information on what happened previously. So this is all now real-time Internet of Things kind of stuff. Um, so it's giving you that description of what's happening, but it's also giving you a prediction on what is likely to happen in the near term. So it will take weather models and the rest of it and sort of say, well, based on a whole range of different environmental considerations, we think that um, uh, there's a very good chance that a whole bunch of odor from your water plant is going to wash over this suburb and you're going to get a lot of uh, angry people. Uh, and, and so, and it's also prescriptive in terms of what can you do about it? So they talk about descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive. We're going to describe to you what's happening. We're going to predict what's likely to happen in the near term. And we're going to give you some actionable steps to do this. So um, clients like this because they need a social license to operate. You can imagine if you are running a sewage plant or you are running a mine and you're thinking of doing some blasting uh, and you're worried about dust. Uh, and, and that kind of stuff. If you're running an airport and there's a lot of people complaining about noise and this kind of stuff, you want to be well across that to minimize, to minimize um, complaints and make sure, again, you have this social license to operate. But frankly, particularly in the airport sector where they operate, there's regulatory um, considerations here. You, you have to measure this kind of stuff as part of your license to operate. So it's not even a choice for, for some of their clients. Um, so that's a very that's a very high level overview. It's a two hundred million dollar market cap company. I've owned it since twenty sixteen. It actually started years and years before that as an environmental consulting company called Pacific Air and Environment. They developed a, a platform internally and then decided that that was the future. Sold off the consulting division, went full on into this SaaS product, and then a couple of years ago they actually did a reverse takeover of uh, EMS Brewer, which is large company that they actually reverse takeover and this is where the airport monitoring side of things came in yeah. and um oh, so much to say I, I, what i'll say is this what i'll say is this is that they have they have reinvented themselves a few years ago and if you look up, up their details you'll see that in um since sort of going full on into this software side of things they started about 2018 with $3 million in revenue. Then they more than doubled that in 2019. Then they tripled that in 2020. And then they doubled that in 2021. Um, there's some acquisitions in there and stuff. But they've got a very strong top-line growth. They're on the cusp of being break-even. They've got a pretty strong balance sheet. There's a few hairs on this, as there always are, and it's important to touch on that. Um, so, you know, they've, they've sort of been promising this EBITDA positive scenario for a while, which hasn't emerged a, as yet. Um, as someone uh, uh, on Twitter was saying uh, very rightly before, there's a bit of inconsistency in their reporting. Um, you know, it's, it's a real bugbear in mind, in fact, when a company sort of gives you, they, they're putting their best foot forward. Here's the things, they highlight all the exciting stuff, but the way that they're reporting ha is, is um, not the same as it was in previous quarters. And it's not that the information is hidden, it's just not as easily accessible as it should be. And they'll be talking about the growth as it's been like the growth of the growth rate. And it just, it just is it rather annoying because you've got to sort of tease a lot of that kind of stuff apart. But, but the idea here is, and again, we spoke to the CEO last year, they're looking at something like they're targeting at least $100 million in, in revenue in the coming years. They've got a huge market opportunity as every, every small cap company does. But mm -hmm. the idea is that they can prosecute that, they can scale effectively, and they can start to reveal the really attractive unit economics that set that the best sex companies manage to do when they do it. Um, I'm wondering, Andrew, you touched on that. Jason Cooper 
uh, it's the I, I, he's probably not. I probably can't say he's the new CEO I- anymore. He joined during COVID, um, kind of like the refreshed um, kind of mantra. And um, one of the things that's kind of plagued Envirosuite for quite a while, I should I would say, is that like, to your point, they have made a lot of acquisitions, and I showed on the screen there before. Quite a few shares have been issued. Um, what do you make of the company making so many acquisitions to fund the growth and then issuing shares? Is that an issue for you or is it something that you say and you're like, well, that's probably required to achieve the growth that they needed to achieve? That's a very good question. And it's a, it, the, I'm going to give you the really annoying answer of it depends. <laughs> okay. um, when, when, you're, when you're just buying growth for the sake of it, um, I think that's a really bad idea. The only reason you want to buy something is because it's it's strengthening your competitive position. It's strengthening your moat. Maybe it's giving you, maybe it's accelerating something that you could otherwise take you a, a long time to do organically. Maybe it allows me to enter into a new geography or a new segment that might take a, a mm. long time and a lot more money to do if I was to do that organically. So there's nothing wrong with acquisitions. Acquisitions can be wonderful. But aside from the the, the strategic sense of it, You've also got to, just like us as investors, you can pay too much. There might be this wonderful opportunity, this wonderful business, but if you're paying, you know, a hundred times EBITDA for that, you know, it's you're gonna. You, where's the value for shareholders in that? And particularly if there's very dilutive share issuances to sort of help fund that. Now, statistically, the odds are, this is an old stat, but I'm sure it's still true. Statistically, out of all acquisitions, one third add create value for shareholders, one third break even, you don't, don't really add or detract, and, and one third destroy value. So there's really only a one in three chance that mm. this is actually going to create value for you as, as a shareholder. Um, so I, I think it is. I think investors are right to be skeptical of it, but you really want to look through that lens of what is this doing for the company and are they paying a sensible price? Um, mm. it, it, a good, interesting, a, a good way to, I think, to look at it is go to the annual report and look at the remuneration report. Look at the mm-hmm. incentives that are on. A lot of CEO executives will be will be get their bonuses and their long term share issuances based on whether they can uh, uh, surpass a certain EBITDA uh, threshold. Now, if you want to grow your operating profit, what's the easiest way to do that? Just buy it. Do it. Now, yeah, acquisition. Doesn't matter if that on if it turns out to be a terrible decision on a per share basis. Doesn't matter what what happens, behind, you know. But is it, 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 they'll get their bonus and they'll be happy with all of that. So I think mm. the really the, it, it's it's a very much overlooked sec- section of the annual report. Incentives matter, and Charlie Munger is very famous uh, for saying that. Show me the incentive, and I will show you the outcome. So the CEO that is benchmarked against long-term earnings per share growth is, I think, is a really wonderful sign as opposed to that which is measured against pure. Uh, I, I should stop using this horrible term, EBITDA, it's just earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. Earnings before a lot of other stuff that actually kind of matter. Uh, BS earnings is what Charlie Munger calls it, given given that we've talked about him. Um, but but yeah, I, I you know, I'm rambling at this point, but I I hope that answers your question. No, it does. It does. Um, we've got some questions that have come through here, mate. So I'm hoping maybe we can cover these off before we get to our city. And uh, one's come through from Jeremy, who, are, who asks, good to see you, Jeremy, by the way. He says, uh, keen to know your thoughts on how EnviroSuite may be affected in the recent bearish trend. I've noticed there has been a small trend of putting ESG in the back seat, hopefully not for long. Yeah. Um, so you, with, with Enviro, so as I said, I've been involved as a shareholder with this company coming up to eight years. Um, mm. Now, I'm, I'm going to say this not to boast, but but partly to boast. It's been, a 50, <laughs> it's been a 50% compound annual return for me, as you'll see on straw man. So it's publicly disclosed kind of return. But the reason I, I put that out there is to sort of say, that is what has happened with, I actually first bought it at 10 cents. And after I bought it, it dropped to 5 cents. That's a 50% loss. It stayed there for a while. And then it went up to 15 and then it came back. And then at one stage, it was like at the high 20s. And now it's come all the way back. I think partic- this is true of all stocks. But I think when you're talking about small cap stocks, you've got to get past this, this short-term trend because it is meaningless. And I took the opportunity to lighten the load on Envirosuite when it got to very high levels because it was, just didn't make any sense. And then 
And then they did a share capital raise at eight cents not that long ago. They had the chance to buy mm. it at 10 cents. It was 50% ago, you know? So it's sort of the, 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 the North Star, I'm very firm in this, the North Star is you have to have an independent view of value. What? Forget the share market. The share market is an idiot. Um, and it is it is erratic. It is, <laughs> it is you know, it is going to, it's bipolar. I shouldn't use that term. It's, it's just going to change its mind all, all over the place. And, and, and what really matters is when it's below a sensible appraisal of value, that's the time to buy. When it's ridiculous, that's the time to lighten the load. Doesn't mean that the market's going to instantly agree with you. In fact, it's going to spend months and possibly years disagreeing with you. But if your analysis is correct, that's the way that you do it. Is it cheap? Yes, I'm going to buy. Does that mean it can't get cheaper? No. If you're me and you buy it, it'll probably drop 30% the next day. It's <laughs> always the case. Nothing so I start more. by saying it's been a really great return. For, it's been one of my best performing stocks. Yet when you look at the chart, it's had all kinds of terrible, long-lasting, bearish trends and the rest of it. But when it's cheap, I'm, 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 a, I'm acquiring. And when it gets silly, I lighten the load. And, and it's about, that's about as complicated as it needs to be. Yeah, we've got, I, um, I think it's, I think it's cheap right now. I've got we've got a couple of uh, questions here. Sparky asked, "Does Envirosuite have any competitors?" And they they do have. I can quickly answer this one, Sparky. They do have some competitors across their um, Omnis uh, line, which is environmental intelligence for like ports and for refineries and that type of thing. But in aviation, they are a leader, and also in their water product, which is their newest product. They are very very early stage in that, but it seems that they are. Um, a leader there too. Um, one final question on this, mate, before we get to our city, and which is from um, MD Kabir, who asks, what's their uh, business economics and what's the competitive advantage? And then the final thing is, which we, we might tuck in here, is um, how, like, how's their, how do you rate their CEO's ability and integrity? Yeah. Oh, wow. So much to unpack there, but it's an excellent question. So the business economics. So they're actually hardware ag agnostic. They don't build the sensors. They're, they're built by third mm. parties. So they will they will uh, um, provide them for their clients if they need them. I'm talking particularly about largely the Omnis side of things here. Uh, and they'll take a bit of a margin on that. It's not, it's not exciting. It's actually pretty low margin. The really attractive economics are with the SaaS business. And that's really nice because you're running one platform there. You just get these lovely recurring revenues. As customers scale up, your actual costs for maintaining and managing that software doesn't increase at all. So it's just you get these these wonderful uh, operating leverage as the business scales. It hasn't been revealed yet, and the reason why it hasn't been revealed is because every although the top line, as I say, has been growing really strongly, they've been adding costs at the same time, mm. and that's in fact you know it, it's a good problem to have. A, a, you 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 can't run. It's a two hundred million dollar business now. Like now, you know, when you were a um, a $50 million business, you just didn't need as many people to run it. You need more. It, it is a good problem to have when you need a bigger sales force. You need more technical people to do the implementations, when you need more R&D focus to stay ahead of the curve. So you, you can't be too puritanical with all of this kind of stuff. And when we spoke to Jason, it was like, looks, and we actually feel as though the cost base is pretty right, at least for the little foreseeable future. So the idea will be that the fixed costs will largely remain in place. As the sales grow up, you'll get very high margin revenue, largely dropping to the bottom line like hot butter uh, in, in mm. a perfect world. We'll see. We'll see whether that happens. But but we we the, what, what you do get in that environment, particularly with where our EnviroSuite is near this inflection point of break even, is that is that you hopefully maintain this aggressive top line growth, but the bottom line growth will be far far greater than that. And that's why these things can look very expensive. I and mean, it's on about four or five times sales, which, which feels sort of up there, particularly in the current environment. Mm. But the way to look about the look at it is I, I try and sort of say, well, let's say they're at, at roughly 100 million in, in, in sales in, in, in over the next five years. They're getting a 15% margin. Uh, what's a sensible multiple? The market might pay for that at the time and just sort of discount that back to, to a price that, that is is sensible but but what you will find is providing that net margin comes through is that you'll you'll find that these these they'll go from a loss making situation to a profit and then that profit will hopefully if they execute well and they scale well will go far greater than that than that top line growth with which hopefully also remains strong yep i like it um so 
Yeah, I guess this is the thing. I, I remember when I met with Jason uh, at the time, I think they were talking about you know, 50% margins potentially um, as they scale and they get their cloud-based system up and running. So um, I think, you know, this is a business which uh, for the most part is, you know, if, if it continues to grow its software business, that's the key. Um, you know, those margins should follow suit. There are, you know, like you said, there are some hairs on it. Um, and uh, Jason has just mentioned that uh, isn't the the market pretty limited for EVS? Uh, and I don't, no. I think, no, yeah. No, well, it's, it's it, I actually, so when you're talking about tech these days, the, the big things are stitched up, like the Googles, the Amazons, even when you sort of get to sort of the Australian sort of scale with the zeros and that, like it's, it's that, that race has been largely won. A lot of growth there still to be had, but it's going to be very hard for a $200 million market cap company to come in and do much there. So this is next to those kinds of markets, very niche, mm -hmm. like extremely niche. So yeah, when you, when you look at it next to global accounting software packages or whatever, or something like wise tech or something, it's very small. But let's not forget, it's a 200 million market cap company. It's actually pretty large relative to the company and the, and the revenue that they can generate for that. Go back to their half year report and you'll see the number of sites that they have within each of their segments versus the, what they call the SAM, the serviceable addressable market. And it's, it's huge for, for them. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. and, and so, look, you've always got to take it with a grain of salt. You, companies love to put up their addressable markets and go, oh, if only we get 10% of that, we'll be massive. Well, most companies don't. But in terms of could they potentially, is it possible? Yes, it is. And, and the market in, there's a lot of, there's a lot of water plants. There's a lot of sewer, sewage plants. There's a lot of mine sites. There's a lot of ports. There's even applications, and they're doing this, in fact, already with smart cities, particularly in the Middle East and all, all kinds mm. of stuff. Number of airports around the world. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a significant market. Mm, I agree. I think the people may, um, I guess, just be, just be mindful of the EVS water unit, which um, is a combination of acquisition and license software. Um, that, that is still really early days. Even though the company may be excited about it, it's still early days, um, but it's kind of that third growth pillar for them. Mate, I figure we may as well move on to Cidian, which trades under the ASX ticker symbol ALC. Um, I know this is another business that you know so well, having introduced me to, um, and I've since spoken to Kate Quirk, the CEO, and um, a business that I've followed for quite some time as well. Um, very similar in the sense that it's a, it's a, a like a technology business, but very, very different in terms of the client base and what it actually does for hospitals. So can you give us kind of the, the 101 on Alcidian and then we can maybe go from there. If you have any questions for Andrew or I, please send them through by the way. Yep, I'll try, I'll try and be quick too. So I'm, I'm gonna, for those that know it well, I'm gonna be glossing over a lot of detail here. So this is a company that's around 150 million in market cap. So similar size to EnviroSuite. Uh, they do healthcare informatics. So what they, you know, they, they're trying to support decision-making in hospitals to improve efficiency and patient outcomes. And, and how do they do that? Well, they take a lot of data, whether that's coming from uh, uh, radiology, pathology, all the various departments, and they're putting that into the hands of, of nurses and doctors so that they can actually take action in that, make the hospital safer, more efficient, uh, better patient outcomes, all of that kind of stuff. Anyone who works in healthcare, and I'm sure there's a few on the on the call that do. We'll notice that there is a huge opportunity in healthcare. It's just a very slow moving space. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that I mean, I, some doctors still use fax machines, right? Um, yeah. Pages, yeah. pages were the, like you know the last like the the last uh, area that they clung onto was 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 for doctors. It just there are very big purchasing decisions that need to be made for for hospitals, and it goes through a very long tender process and it just. The whole world has gone digital and hospitals are, of course, going digital too, but they're, they're, they're not at the forefront and they've been kicking screen. You know, they're, they're a, when we spoke to Kate Quirk, the CEO of our city, and she was, she's worked in the industry for, for ages and she's saying there's still systems that she sold 25 years ago that are still being used. Now, 25 years in the land of wow. tech, you know, it's like, it's like going back to the stone tablet almost. It's, it's just crazy. So <laughs> what, what, what they do, and here's the important thing to note, is that then they're, they're not replacing all of these legacy systems, but rather they're augmenting them. So uh, there has been a move to digitize a lot of the stuff. So the hospitals are moving from paper 
and whiteboards mm. and the chart at the end of the bed, which still get used, paper charts at the end of a bed. I mm-hmm. mean, 2022, it blows the mind. Um, but now more and more stuff is going digital and they're, 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 their main, their flagship product is something called Maya Precision and it will take all of this and it puts it into, a, into either on a smartphone or a tablet or a display in the hospital that allows you to track the patient allows you to see everything that you need to see. We'll even do predictive stuff as well with a bit of clever AI in terms of what needs to happen. And there's a lot I'm glossing over here because there's lots of different modules. They've got another product called Patient Track. But all in all, that's that's the big picture here. They're in 377 hospitals. Um, they focused in Australia and New Zealand initially, and then they've more recently moved over into the UK. Uh, the UK has a bunch of... Um, uh, NHS trusts, which look after a lot of hospitals, and they've had some real success there as well. So they're now in 26% of trusts in the UK. They're in about 44% of Australian healthcare facilities. But that is that belies the opportunity because while they might be in a, in a facility, it might be a very small part of their product suite that is being used. So within an existing facility, there's very big potential for that to ramp up, but there's also very big potential for them to go into more and more sites. And there are very, one of the questions we asked Kate when we spoke to her was what's the network effect potential here? So it's mm. it's really hard to get into a hospital. Like you, you got to imagine here is like, who is going to want to, yes, you might have a legacy system that is in need of replacement, but it works. Are we going to risk everything on some relatively small unknown Australian company and commit, you know, millions and millions of dollars in years of work for some things? It, it's very hard to break into. But Alcidian's at this exciting stage where they've kind of got the foot in the door and they've got this reference site. You can imagine if your job is in sales and you knock on the door of, and you're speaking to a hospital administrator and say, look, I've got this really great software and it does all this stuff. And they're like, oh yeah, who else uses it? Well, no one yet, but you could be the first. That's a very hard sale to make. When you can sort of say, actually, Prince of Wales Hospital has been using us for the last three years. They've used us in this and this. We've never had any downtime, et cetera, et cetera. The, the sales proposition becomes infinitely easier and not only that that first site that you're in maybe dipped their toe in the water and said okay well we might start using this module oh our doctors and nurses love it actually we're going to roll this out to this other wing or to this other site that we look after so this is also a company whose sales have just been growing incredibly incredibly well this year they're on track for probably something like 33 million in sales that'll be 30 percent growth on what they did last year which was about 26 million um Last year was 42% growth on what they did in, in 2020. You know, you go back to 2018. That's not that long ago, four years, and they were doing 3 million in sales. So they have 10 x their sales. It's a little Adelaide company that spent mm. th- – these are these classic companies, Owen, that's the overnight success that's been 10 years in the making. Uh, so mm. they come onto the radar sort of for, for people now, but they've actually been a, a long – difficult burn to sort of get where they are but again it's interesting like with EnviroSuite they're at this point now where they're st- they've got the product they've got the validation they've got the sales traction um, they've got the reference sites and um, I'll probably stop at that point because otherwise I'll just keep on going but it's, it's an interesting no company with a big potential so Rogers said public host- hospitals do software changeovers poorly on the whole, like trying to yeah. change a tire on a moving car. Agreed, yes. Roger. Um, yep. Yes. It, and that, like to Andrew's point just now, many hospitals are fast followers. What that means is mm. they'll follow the reference case. They don't want to be the reference case, but they'll follow on from that. Um, Andrew, I just thought I'd maybe just give a special clap because um, if I just come back to the stock price chart here in um, SelfWealth, I go here. The company has fallen considerably in recent times. So high of you know thirty six to forty two cents, um, not too long ago. Now down at you know twelve and a half cents, back to where it was. You have to go back to twenty nineteen to see Isn't that type it fantastic. of level. Mm-hmm. Isn't it fantastic? You say so. I'm just. I, I, I mean, that probably says all we need to know. But for those people who are looking at this and thinking, oh well, this is scary, or is it time to sell? Like, what's going on? What do you make of that? I'll, I'll, I'll repeat my comments before with EnviroSuite. So again, there's two questions to ask you. The first question is, what is the business doing? And, mm-hmm. and hopefully we're given a bit of a, a flavor of, of what, what, what it's doing and what it potentially can continue to do. And then there's, what is the market doing? So I got back involved with this company two or three years ago 
at, at much lower prices, obviously, and it ran up to 41 cents. It was ridiculous. You'll see on Strawman, um, if, if you're one of our premium users, if, if not, it'd be blurred out. But I, I was selling in the 30s. Did I pick the top? Nowhere near it. But it, it was just, it was, it was well above what I thought was a reasonable price uh, at, at, at the time. So unfortunately, what happens, particularly people who are new to the market, it only comes onto your radar because you see this, this thing going parabolic. Mm. And everyone loves a party. Everyone loves a winner. Everyone loves, you know, a share price that, that's, that's shooting up. And so people buy in and they get more excited and they buy in more and more and more. And then you're buying something not because – Peter Lynch says, know what you own and why you own it. And you get these situations, particularly in 2021. Remember what – I mean, the, the world has changed radically in the last six to ten months. But remember back then it was just – all about growth. It didn't matter about profitability. You know, ridiculously high um, sales multiples. Interest rates don't matter. They're going to be low forever. And people are just piling into this thing with a, with gay abandon, and it was ridiculous. And 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 then as that starts to fall, you see that it plays out in reverse, and people start to panic. The, the quick money, the fast money, the hot money. They're there for a, a quick time, a good time, not a long time kind of money. And then that feeds on itself. And then people more and more capitulate, capitulate, capitulate. And you, you, you get this momentum with stocks where it's sort of like things go from undervalued to overvalued and then they come back and they don't just stay at fair value. They swing all the way back to too cheap again. I would argue Alcidian is now at a point where it's like, now, now this is interesting, right? I, I, if, look, I'll, my value, last time I did a valuation on it, a few months ago now, I thought this was probably worth, based on my expectations, somewhere in the vicinity of 17 to 18 cents. Um, so less than half of what it was on the market at one point in time. But at the same mm -hmm. time, 30% above where it is now. So that's why I say, isn't it a wonderful thing? Now, I, I say I sold some at the top. <laughs> I, I absolutely, not at the top, when it was higher. A, it definitely wasn't at the top, and B, it mm. definitely wasn't all of it. So, you know, wouldn't wouldn't that have been nice? You're never going to do that. But, but again, as I say, if I if, if I'm half right, and I feel as though this is a business that that is that is worth somewhere around that, and let's add in a margin of safety to account for the fact that no one can predict the future, and I'm probably wrong. I mean, there's, there's pretty reasonable upside there. Um, so I, I think it's a good thing that it's come down because the business is only, as I say, they're about to report something like 30% sales growth. They've got a strong balance sheet. Uh, where mm. are my notes here as well? Um, uh, 17 million in cash, positive operating cash flows when you exclude some of these one-off acquisition costs. Now it's only this is 85% gross margin business and it's on sale because the market is now in a very, very bad mood. And I know this is very probably people throwing stuff at the screen right now. He's like, oh, good and well, because I bought it 40 cents. Well, I, unfortunately, you can't change the past, but you can change the future. And the question is now is, is whatever you, whether you bought this thing at 5 cents a share or 40 cents a share, the fact is, is that you own it at today's price. And the mm. calculus is, is today's price representative of value? And if the end, maybe you're wrong, but maybe you fundamentally disagree with me, which is fine. But if, if the answer is yes, well, then, then hold. In fact, maybe buy some more or, 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 or weight your portfolio according to the risk reward trade off as you, as you see it. Um, but I would Andrew, much rather buy this at 12 cents than at 40 cents. For sure. I, I obviously I've known you for quite a few years and, um, I, I've read a lot of your stuff, including um, one of your earliest write-ups on Alcidian. I'm just going to ask a quick, a quick question before I get to hopefully two quick questions from the audience, uh, which is how do you value small cap companies? Because um, I think maybe people yeah. would be surprised if you do or don't use discounted cash flows and you know forecast every line item on the financial statements. Just to, I mean, as quickly and concisely as you can, how do you do it? It's very difficult. Very hard, um, but I, I like I like to keep it simple. Um, uh, and and I should say too, I don't. I think the mistake people make is they feel as though they have to come up with an intrinsic value. Do some mm. scenario now. Go. Here's my best case. I think Alcidian can be doing eighty million in sales by FY twenty five, and I think they'll get a twenty percent net margin at that point. So all of a sudden, mm. I know what my I've got an assumption for what profit is going to be at that point in time. 
divide that by the number of shares that are on issue. Now I've got an earnings per share. I can say, well, given that growth, given that performance, share market's probably happy to pay 30 times PE. So I can, I can multiply that by 30. Now I've got what I think the share price will be in FY25. Mm. And now I could say, well, I want a 15% return between then and now. So I can just divide that number by 1.15. I can discount that back by three years and it gets me a target price. But then I'm also going to say, maybe it doesn't do that. Maybe we're only at 40 million in sales. Maybe at that point, costs have ramped up. Maybe they're only, maybe they're only on a 3% net margin. At that point, maybe mm. at that point, the share market is only happy to pay a price earnings multiple of 15. Um, and I will come up, they'll, they'll end up with two very, very different numbers. But I can I can come up with some scenarios. I can come up with my best guess. And they're all going to be wrong. But <laughs> I, I know what needs to happen for, for, for my investment thesis to be correct. And then in next quarter, we'll get another update. And the quarter after that, we'll get, an, and I can, I can, I can, I have this touchstone to, to keep coming back to sort of saying, was this reasonable? Sometimes you'll find, actually, I've been too conservative. This is growing faster mm. than I thought. Oh, wow, they're scaling really well. Actually, maybe I need to bump it up. So, so, it's, it, so A, don't stick with one. Come up with a variety. B, don't let it be a static number. Update. It's okay to change your mind. In fact, it's critical to change your mind over time as, as, the, as new information comes to light. So what was it um, John Maynard Keynes said um, you know, when the facts change, I change my mind. You know, what do you do? Um, yep. of, of course. <laughs> um, so so I, I think th there is no one right way of doing valuation. I think simpler is better for a lot of a lot of these early stage companies. Um, and just go with just go with go with roughly right as opposed to specifically wrong. Mm. If, if I'm if I'm roughly oh, let's go with that what did I say seventeen cents with LCD and you know it's it's probably thirty percent either side of that right but I can still say well there's much less downside than there is upside even with those error bars on the side of it and it also means if it gets to twenty cents I'm not going to dump a lot because I respect the fact that I'm an idiot and in my evaluation is probably going to be wrong <laughs> when it gets to forty cents like well that a hell of a lot has to go right. So you don't want to you don't want to be in all in all out on ten percent above or, or below these these reasonably rough estimates, but it gives you a north star to focus on, and um, uh, it it helps remove this the the, mm. the 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 push and pull of the market telling you you're right you're wrong you're an idiot you're a genius, which is just going to mess mm. with your head. Yeah, I like it, uh, mate. Just in. Uh... Thinking of time here, I love the chat, um, but there are two questions I would really, really like to get your thoughts on. One is from MD Kabir again, um, which is, do you sell a stock if its price goes uh, very high slash overvalued since you prefer to hold long term? I, um, it, it depends on the, on the, so just following up on that, if, if I feel as though a stock is, and it depends on the nature of the business, if we're talking about Woolworths, for example, you know, whatever happens in the future, it's it's you're never going to have five years of sustained twenty percent compound growth in earnings award. You're just not. Um, at the same time, it's probably never going to be that bad. So mm. the, the more mature the business is, the more the stronger it's 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 the better established it is. I think you can be a little bit more fussy around those things. When you're talking about small cap, fast growth companies, I think you naturally need to be a pretty forgiving of things because there is such a wide range of, of outcomes there. So if it gets, you know, 15, 20% above uh, my best in my valuation, I'll probably start to lighten the load. But that will also mm -hmm. depend on what the opportunity set is. Like it, sometimes, in fact, you'll see on some of my straw man trades, I sold out of some positions recently. Not because I actually don't think anything differently of them. I just needed some cash to put into some other things, you know? So, so all of that weighs it, but when it, when it gets really well above what, what any sensible analysis will tell you, I think that's the time. A good example of this with Prometicus, right? Mm. Where but I think I love, I think it's probably one of the best businesses on the ASX and it got crazy and I sold a very significant chunk down on the way up. And then just to rub my face in it, the market went up another 30% from there. And it's actually still way up there. So this is not an exact science. This is not an exact science. So roughly right okay. as opposed to specifically wrong.
I like it roughly right rather than specifically wrong. It's a it's a phrase that I've since repeated after hearing you uh, say it. One more question comes from uh, Jeremy, which is, what do you think about the discrepancies in their latest annual report? I'm thinking you've read between the lines, so I'm keen to get your insights as to why they've done that. Um, which I, I don't know which discrepancies, Jeremy, you're referring to. I don't know, Andrew, if you know um, which discrepancies. Well, there's, there's a lot of information in each report, so if you can sp spell it out, I'll, I'll do my best to, to answer it. I didn't think that there was too much um, out there, unless it's the inconsistency in how sometimes they focus on one item in the previous half and then a you know a different one, which, can, as I said before, can be annoying. But, so yeah, sorry, I need, I need a bit more um, detail on that one. Yeah, no worries, Jeremy. If you can just follow up there really quick, but um, if he's watching in real time, I hope he is. Um, oh, sorry. That, so he said that was for EVS and virus suite uh, discrepancies. I think maybe perhaps. Oh, yeah, really annoying. Group. Yeah, really annoying. Yeah. 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 The, the growth on growth and yeah, things like they're, that. They're, 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 uh, yeah. I, I think the, the best thing to, to, it just means that you've got to do more work because a lot of the information will be there if you dig into it more and a lot of mm. that mean i actually keep a lot of spreadsheets on things where you just you, they will compare with you know what they want you to compare with but a lot of the data has been re released in previous things and that'll you know, picture is a thousand words if you can just plot the annual recurring revenue or for each segment and and you know form your own picture but it does it can be very difficult particularly when the business has made very large transition transactions and yeah. divestments and all other it may it can get very ava risk group which we it was mentioned before is a great example of that it just it's really hard to do because the business is very different than it was a year ago um mm. so it yeah and mm. one quick thing i have to mention on particularly in small caps here people will often rightly point out some negatives with them and and the reality is i think is that you're going to find that almost every company you find has hairs on it almost there's, there's no such thing as a perfect company so the, the, it's more about don't throw something out just because there's a few negatives. It's, it's a question of how they, they stack up with the positives. And unfortunately, mm. you've kind of got a stomach, some things that are less than ideal. Uh, if they're a deal breaker, by all means, get out. But yeah, it's the nature of the beast in yeah. small cap land. I will also add acquisitions, Muddy the Waters. Uh, with uh, Alcidian, it actually reminded me, they did actually do some interesting things with their gross profit margin a couple of years ago, which um, I will recall that was a little bit peculiar at the time, but analysts quickly corrected them on that and they kind of summed that up. Um, uh, there were a lot of great questions that have come through. Uh, Jason Marshall said, Isn't it, aren't the reports of the ASX just the investor marketing? Um, and yeah, many of them are. Like a lot of the time yeah. we just need cold, hard audited financials. Um, Stevie, you said, can you ask Andrew to guess the top stock uh, both bought and sold on the self wealth platform today. Um, the thing is, Stevie, he heard he was listening before when I gave them out, but he did tell me he had this to say in response to my joke, and I hope you don't mind me repeating this one, Andrew. He <laughs> said, "He said statistics are rubbish. Eighty-three percent of people know that, um, and that, that's in reference." I think that's uh, a Homer Simpson to quote. To be fair, <laughs> full, full attribution. You know, worries, mate. Um, but Andrew, I I just want to say thanks for taking some time tonight. Uh, one of the comments before was could just listen to Andrew talk all day. And we originally scheduled this for about 20 minutes. And I, and uh, I can talk all day. Let's be honest. <laughs> and we're here 45 minutes later. So um, mate, no, like you're a wealth of wealth of knowledge um, on investing. You've been doing this a very long time and it's just great to get a cool head on the show talking about part of the market that a lot of investors, uh, you know, maybe not brave enough to go into, but w are really keen to learn more about, which is small cap investing. So uh, on behalf of everyone, uh, thanks for joining me on the show. Don't forget you can follow up Andrew on Twitter uh, and strawman.com. The link is in the uh, description below. So you can click that link and head over to strawman.com. Andrew, once again, thanks for joining us, mate. Absolute pleasure, man. I could do this, do this all day long. Wonderful. Thanks, mate. Have a great evening. Thank you. Well, that was Andrew Page from strawman.com. Don't forget you can head over there, strawman.com, and uh, get a free account. So uh, just a few little things. We have run a little bit over time tonight, but that is completely fine. I see that uh, Todd has uh, said, see you on Motley Fool Money Ram. Uh, that's Andrew's nickname is Ram. So uh, we've just got a couple of little things. One thing is I want to leave you with uh, my uh, quote for this evening, which is a very, very quick one, a very, very simple one, which is this. It is live as if you were to die tomorrow, but learn as if you were to live forever. And that is from Mahatma Gandhi. And it actually is on, a, is on the Masters Invest website. Uh, I took that quote. It equally applies to 
our life in general, but also to the way we learn about investing. Live as if uh, invest as if you're going to invest forever. And I think if you start to do that, um, you start to make a lot better, clearer decisions. Um, it's been a wonderful night. Thanks to Andrew for joining us. I'll be adding uh, Alcidian to the low tofu portfolio, even though it is not uh, low risk, I will be adding it to the portfolio and in Virusweet because it is uh, at an inflection point, but it does have somewhat of a checkered history is going into the high stakes portfolio. Just to recap, every week we go into self-wealth and we add some stocks to our virtual portfolio. You can do that over on the side here under settings. You can build your own virtual portfolio with us. So, um, Two really interesting companies tonight. If you do like uh, us talking about smaller companies, please let me know. Say, get, tell us in the chat because it actually helps us um, design better, better live sessions. So I can see everyone saying thank you. Um, but if you do want to us to talk about that, if you want me to get any special guests, I've got uh, a few guests on my list that you have given me, including uh, Mathan, Summer Sundram. I've got a few other investors. I'm going to try for some of the big dogs that you guys uh, gave me a few weeks ago. Don't forget, we've got uh, the Big Swinging Stocks episode out now. Rob is in Vietnam at the moment, but he would be, I, I reckon he'd be watching and he'd be saying, I want to make sure you mention Big Swinging Stocks. It's out now on Spotify. Uh, you can get it there on the screen. You can see with myself and my co-host on the Australian Finance Podcast, Kate Campbell, we were talking to Alex. It was a great chat. Um, there's so much to get through tonight. Thank you for this evening, everyone, ladies and gents. Uh, if you want to follow up with Andrew on Twitter, head on over to Sage underscore Simeon. And don't forget, uh, inside Self Wealth, there are still a lot of investors sitting on cash. And as we've learned over the past few months, um, it's really about time in the market, not time in the market, that leads to the best results over the ultra long term. I've spoken to a, a, a couple of investors this week, one investor who um, has been investing for 20 years and has been doing that professionally very well, uh, and another investor who is one of Australia's leading economists. And both of them, I asked them plainly, have you changed your the way you invest because of what's happening in the economy lately? And both of them said no. Um, so I think that is something to uh, keep in mind. Uh, thank you, everyone, for another great session. Thank you, Danica, Stevie, um, MD, Ethan, uh, Pima, Jeremy. Welcome, even though you were late. It's great to have you. Um, I don't think you gave me a score for my joke, by the way, so I'll be following you up on that one next week. But hopefully next week I'll be back in Melbourne and I'll be re re reporting to you then. I've actually got another guest. I'm going to say if you liked Andrew tonight, you're going to like my next guest a lot. He's coming up in two weeks. Yeah, I'm not going to tell you his name. It's a he. I'm not going to tell you his name. But let's just say you see his face a lot in the media and he's been doing this for quite some time. Uh, Todd, I can see he said Jeff Wilson. Not Jeff Wilson, but there's a lot going on. Uh, anyway, that's it for tonight. Thank you for joining in. Goodbye for now. Goodbye from Queensland. I hope you have a wonderful day. If you're, in, if you're at Mount Buller, remember to be safe down there uh, on the snowfields. And thank you for tonight. I will see you next week.